Talladega, I think, has a reputation, certainly in the uh, in the uh, motorsports world, as a as a as the action track, if you want to use that term, uh, particularly in the big track category. Probably the most uh, year in and year out, the most exciting races, as uh, uh, to my knowledge, that I've seen in any type of racing anywhere in the world occur there at Talladega. behind it uh, and there's no doubt about it it's here to stay uh, it's a racetrack this uh, it's got a lot of prestige now and uh, they're filling the grandstands and won't be long before they'll be building a lot more grandstands and they'll keep filling them it's a it's a great racetrack Talladega is I think the probably the greatest racetrack in the world when it comes right down to it they definitely got the speed record um, it's so it's really what you call a fairly easy racetrack to drive that is, if, you could, if your nerves will stand it. Talladega is, the, I guess, the premier speed racetrack. The drafting there is so important. Understanding how to make your moves in traffic there and timing everything where you never have to get out of the throttle. When you come up on slow cars, you have to envision what you're going to do before you get there. And it's kind of like a ballet. Everything's got to be just perfect. And once that works, once you get that chemistry down, you're the king in that racetrack. For a quarter of a century of auto racing, Talladega Super Speedway has been synonymous with two things, speed and drama. Also, there have been more than a few surprises. It's a lot of tough competition, a lot of people run close together here. You know, when something happens here, it normally happens big. If somebody asked me Talladega, how Talladega is, 
I just have to say that Talladega is awesome as far as not being able to predict what's going to happen. Everything happens so fast and it looks big and it is. It's massive, it's real wide and all, but still yet when something comes up, you come up on it pretty real fast and, and then it gets awful small. The brainchild of the late Bill France, the racetrack was built on what is said to be an Indian burial ground in northeast Alabama. Suspicious types think that is the reason the first 25 years of auto racing in Talladega has provided fans with startling results and incredible excitement. I've heard about the Indian burial grounds and all this stuff and uh, you know the first four or five years we run down there we had all kinds of trouble with tires coming apart and people wrecking and all this kind of stuff and I said well you know maybe there's something to this kind of stuff but uh, I mean you know have fights in the infield and the people jumping on each other and the people on the racetrack jumping on each other so uh, I don't think there's nothing to that but uh, if you start adding up one side and minus and another, you might they might be something there. <laughs> I felt it. I felt that old Indian kick me a few times. I knocked the motor out of a car. I hit so hard one time on the back straightaway there. I was leading the race and and we come around and I guess Ramos Stott and a bunch of them had started about a 28 car pile up on the back straightaway and you couldn't see anything. I come off the second corner there. It was like trying to see through a, an ink bottle. You know, it was just. That red dirt flying everywhere and the black smoke off all the tires on the cars and I kept running for these openings, you know, light places in the clouds of smoke and I heard, uh, I guess Bobby Allison was second and I heard him hit somebody and it sounded like a bass drum, boom, and I kept hunting these light places, you know, and I said, I believe I'm going to make it and I didn't realize like an opening where I was going to get through there and I, I tell you what, I hit so hard it knocked the motor out of the car. And the last thing I heard was Harry Hyde. I was in the middle of the deal. And there's a caution on the back straightaway. And I, I said, if I just thought, I'd said, yeah, and we're it, you know? <laughs> Indian spirits put aside the daring men and the rolling machines who have won races on the 2.66 mile asphalt layout are more enthralled with a challenge associated with driving faster and harder than their competitors. It's the biggest speedway and you know in the world I guess you would say and uh, it's the fastest no doubt about it uh, speedway so everyone that uh, that races of course they want to win everywhere they go but uh, I'm, I'm sure that everyone would like to win a race at Talladega because it is the biggest and the fastest. Talladega is the fastest of the fast. All victory lanes are great but uh, winning at a place like Talladega when uh, it's a big racetrack, it's a fast racetrack, it's a nerve-wracking racetrack and uh, it's just a, a, a big thrill and a pleasure to stand in victory lane after you win a race at Talladega. I first went on the racetrack it was uh, I think I ran 165 miles an hour, and I talked to another guy, and he said, yeah, I said, uh, I said, how fast are you? He said, 190, 92. He said, uh, how fast are you going? I said, well, 160. He said, I can go 160 backward around this place. He said, it's so easy. So uh, I was letting up, and I said, I'll go back out. And he said, I'm going to watch you qualify, and yell it wide open. So then we ended up qualifying, you know, about 188. So that was, <laughs> that was a breathtaking thing. Regardless of the view, either that afforded drivers through mirrors, fans through binoculars, crew members through squinted eyes, or fabled spirits from beyond, Talladega Super Speedway has established itself as a fixture in American sports history. After all, it is the fastest of all racetracks, and a Winston Cup driver who rolls through the thunder to experience the triumph there is considered something special.
to be a winner at Talladega, you've got to be one of the most aggressive people on the speedway at that time. Talladega is a fairly easy track to run. As uh, long as everything is going okay, you don't have to be real, real polished to run Talladega. But when something happens, it's when you need to have it a little extra, a little bit. But if it happens in the wrong place and it's right in front of you, it's nothing you can do. But hang on till it stops. Make sure you're okay. The guy that wins here is a racer. He's uh, he's willing to lay it on the line and not worry what's around the next turn down there. Uh, this thing here takes total commitment from the driver's seat just to live with whatever happens. And uh, I've always liked that part of it. While Winston Cup racing remains the heart and soul of Talladega Super Speedway, as founding father Bill France preferred, it has been the scene of unusual assaults on speed records. Mark Donahue brought an Indy car to the track to establish a closed course record. The manufacturers of Saab automobiles successfully made an attack on a record they dubbed the longest run. Lynn St. James wanted to go faster than any female in history and did. In fact, you might find any type vehicle on the track there. But Bill France opened Talladega Super Speedway in 1969 with the idea of making it the fastest NASCAR race track in history. Oh yes, mm -hmm. and he did. And uh, it's still the fastest, you know, for a light. There's some uh, Indianapolis type cars have run faster than maybe what a car has at Talladega. Uh, I think it, it, uh, at Michigan they may have run a little faster now, or maybe even at Texas. I can't recall the exact number, but you take a, the, the current 1993 or 94 automobile, whatever it is, it'll run faster at Talladega than it will anywhere else. Well, Talladega, uh, Alabama uh, is the proud owner of the fastest racetrack in the world, and uh, as a result, there's a lot of things that happen to a driver. Uh, a little bit different than, than at some of the other places. They used to talk about the Doppler effect or something like that. I don't know. I think we found out that what it actually was was wax in our ears dropping down, and, and we, we'd go, you'd sink the car into the corner, and all of a sudden you'd, you'd just about go deaf. You couldn't hear too much. And uh, of course, now they've run there for 25 years, and, and I think perhaps the drivers are a lot more accustomed to that. The first stock car driver to negotiate the long straightaways and high banks was Donnie Allison of Hueytown, Alabama. I was in pretty much awe and at that particular time I didn't know what to expect. I've been around Daytona a lot but it was so different. Uh, you know, you, one degree of banking you wouldn't think you would notice. Or uh, I think uh, I think the thing that made the biggest impression on me was the width of the racetrack, the actual width of the racing surface. It's one lane wider than Daytona, which a lot of people don't think that's very much, but uh, it's a lot traveling that speed. In other words, Bill France had a dream and a racetrack to make it become a reality, but only after it threatened to become a nightmare. The 1969 Talladega 500 at the then called Alabama International Motor Speedway was marred by a Grand National driver's boycott. Most of the men scheduled to place their hands on the steering wheels on that Sunday walked out because they feared the high speeds and subsequent wear on tires made the racetrack unsafe. But to make sure his dream was fulfilled, a determined Bill France paid extra money to Grand American drivers who competed on Saturday to fill the holes in the starting field. To this day, former driver turned car owner Richard Childress is thankful for that vision. Bill France was a uh, senior, was a, a type of man that was a very determined person. He was going to run that race that day, at no matter whatever it took to run it. And uh, he had made a large investment and. Think he, besides that, he was a proud man, and, and his pride was at stake, too, to run that race. He was so proud, he got put together a car himself. You know, had someone to bring him a car. He got in it and ran around here at his age. You know, I don't know what the speeds were. It was up in the 190s, because I think we were, they had ran like 200 back then, or close to 200. And, uh, but, you know, for a man to do that, just to show that, you know, he would get out there and race, uh, and you had to have a lot of pride in, in, in what he was doing. And uh, I've always had a lot of admiration for him before that and after that. Uh, he made a believer out of a lot of people. He didn't like to hear the word that you can't do it. And uh, he wanted to, uh, if he set his mind to doing something or accomplishing something or going from point A to point B, he tried to figure out how to get there, you know.
The winner in the first race was Richard Brickhouse, a Grand National driver who, with a clear conscience and no shortage of emotion, decided not to walk out with his peers. I went to Talladega to race, and everybody was preparing, even though it was uh, the controversy about the conditions that we were uh, going to have to race under. But with, uh, with me being associated with the feelings that I had for Bill France, and NASCAR as a whole, I was too proud to be there. I was too happy to be a part of it. And there was uh, the night before the race and thousands of people poured in that place to see a race and, and that's what I went down there for and I made up my mind that's what I intended to do. That courageous decision by Richard Brickhouse might have changed the course of auto racing history. It definitely met the approval of Bill France who awarded the first Talladega Super Speedway winner with a cherished gift. This ring, as you can see, very well worn, but this represents winning the first race at Talladega. And uh, it's got about 25 years of wear on it, and I'm very proud of it. In retrospect, the boycott before the first race might have added something to the mystique of Talladega Super Speedway. After all, people tend to pay attention when the best drivers known to man balk at the opportunity to compete on the fastest racetrack in the world. The best thing that ever happened to Talladega was that we did not run that particular race. And I'll explain that in the sense that nobody had ever heard any world. You might, I mean, if you were from Alabama, you hadn't heard tell of Talladega. Okay, and all of a sudden, Talladega was on all the newspaper, all the TVs, all the radio stations for two or three weeks. Now, if we'd have went down there, run the race, Richard Petty had won the race, Monday it would have been on radio, TV, Tuesday nobody would have heard of Talladega again. So we'd have had to wait until next year. But the way it worked out, the PR that they got out of that one race was unheard of. There's no way they could have bought that much PR for Talladega racetrack on a first race basis. So it might have been bad at the time, and the drivers and the, and the owners did what they thought was right, and France did what he thought was right. In the long run, it worked out good for both sides. It put a, uh, a, uh, a black mark on the picture, I think, when something like that happens. Uh, uh, nobody won, you know, the, the, the race teams, uh, they didn't win. Uh, the track certainly didn't win. Uh, the fans that came just like for almost over a year uh, that were there, uh, they were disappointed. But uh, be as it may, I mean, that's, that's 25 years ago. And uh, since then, there's been a lot, of, a lot of water under the bridge and a lot of exciting races, as I, you know, as I discussed earlier. The speeds were too fast for the tires we had. Uh, the tires were definitely coming apart. Uh, it was a dangerous situation. Uh, uh, looking back, I can see Bill France's side of it, too. Uh, we did our thing, and he did his thing, and uh, he made it work. And thank goodness uh, he didn't throw his hands up and, uh, and, and quit, but uh, he was just that kind of, kind of man. He, he wasn't a quitter, and, uh, and he made it work, and it's, it's worked to everybody's benefit. Twice each year, Talladega Super Speedway attracts the top drivers and more than 100,000 spectators to two of the foremost events on the Winston Cup circuit the Winston 500 during spring, and the Die Hard 500 during summer. After numerous ups and downs, as well as countless dramatic finishes, the winners in the first 49 races remember how waving checkered flags cooled their faces at the end of grueling runs. Meanwhile, auto racing fans remember hearing thunder and seeing triumph on extraordinary afternoons at Talladega Super Speedway. Done it again. Wow, what a race. 
He's as good as you say he is. I mean, he is just spectacular. Determined Dale Earnhardt has won six times. Entering the 1994 season, he had four victories in the most recent eight events to go with back-to-back -back checkered flags in the 1983 and 1984 Talladega 500s. He held off Ernie Irvin down the stretch in a dramatic finish to win the 1993 Die Hard 500. One uh, definite ingredient is have Dale Earnhardt in a car. Uh, we've won with cars that uh, weren't as good as other people, and we've had great cars here too. But I think Dale has been a great factor for us winning the races at Talladega. You have to give Earnhardt credit. Uh, you don't win six times there at Talladega, but I also congratulate Earnhardt for being, I guess you'd have to say, he's a master there now. And uh, at one time, I was that. Three drivers have claimed four victories each at Talladega Super Speedway, making each something special in the competitive annals of auto racing. They are Bobby Allison, Buddy Baker, and Darrell Waltrip. I think the really best thing about it, so easy to share it with the folks here at home. And of course, you know, you stand there in victory lane and uh, you just have to really feel good about uh, being in victory lane anywhere, but here at home, even more so. Bobby Allison had victories at Talladega Super Speedway that spanned more than two decades. His first came in the 1971 Talladega 500. His last came in the 1986 Winston 500. He won 84 Winston Cup events overall. The right place to be has always been different. You know, the one race that I won there, uh, I was leading, and Earnhardt was trying to make a pass on me, you know, and just uh, got up beside me, and I was able to hold him off and, and uh, beat him back to the line. Uh, that's what worked on that given day. Then there was that frightful moment when Bobby Allison crashed into the grandstand fence and proved how safe Winston Cup cars are by walking away. Buddy Baker has proved Talladega Super Speedway can become a playground for some drivers. He put together a nice streak there, winning the 1975 Winston 500, the 1975 Talladega 500, and the 1976 Winston 500. In my opinion, I mean, if you're a Super Speedway driver, and I, I felt that that was my a strong suit if I had one, and, and uh, I always felt like if you win there, then that's the ultimate racetrack. Incredibly, Buddy Baker has been second at Talladega Super Speedway six times, making him the most suitable rival for Dale Earnhardt in the battle for superiority. Now, you know, they say uh, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, but at Talladega Nancy, it's just as good as beating them by a full lap. On both events at Talladega Super Speedway and fouled up an interesting Talladega 500 advertising campaign. The catch line was 13 races and 13 faces, meaning there had not been any repeat winners in the event until him. Advertising campaigns, it's like if Ford sponsors a race, the Chevrolet is surely going to win it. And uh, if if uh, Haviland Motor Oil sponsors a race, you know a car with Exxon Motor Oil is going to win it, so it just seems to work that way. If the Miller Company, beer company sp sponsors a race, the Budweiser car will win it. It just kind of works that way. For those who wonder, the man who had 84 Winston Cup victories entering the 1994 season has astute observations when addressing what it takes to win on the fastest of racetracks. We get the white flag and everybody's Everybody's up on the edge of the seat. Everybody's got them gloves pulled up and they're up on them steering wheels. And uh, we go down the first turn. And we'd been running high all day long, real high and around the top of the racetrack. And so we get the white flag, we come down, we get to turn one, I go in high, and I just cut my car to the bottom of the racetrack. <laughs> Left them three turkeys hanging out there. Of course, there's three of them, so they're not, they're not hurting. I come off of turn two over there, I come out on the back straightaway, I got a huge lead. I really pulled out a big lead on them. Well, that was good and that was bad. That meant they had me sitting out there by myself to draft up to. So here they come, boogity, boogity, boogity. They catch me just before we get to the third turn. I stayed low. When I got to the third turn, I moved up. I just barely brushed into Kale, but it was just enough to get him loose. That caused him and, them other, and the other two to have to slow down a little bit. I drove the bottom, beat them back to the line, won my first race here at Talladega. Two International Motorsports Hall of Fame members and a deceased driver who probably would have secured such distinction make up a group of men who have claimed three victories each at Talladega Super Speedway. The late...
Princeton 500. I mean, it just seems like that race is just a, that feeling of the home court advantage. When, when you walk up to the podium for driver introductions and you hear those people cheer out, I mean, it sends adrenaline through me full blast. Davy Allison had what seemed like a million friends on race day in Alabama. Also, he got a boost from the sinking sun in 1987 after the Bobby Allison wreck red flagged the event for three hours. The race in 87, I remember, because that's the one that was shortened because of it got dark. And I was running second there, driving Junior's car, and we had a Chevrolet that time. And, and uh, the car was really good. Davy was leading the race. And so we were just sitting there running, and uh, we were catching him a little bit. His car was fat, really fast that day, and uh, we could, about all we could do was hang on to him. But our car seemed to handle better than his after we ran a long time. And they came on the, Tim came on the radio and said, hey, you only got 10 laps to go. They just shortened the race. And I thought, oh, man, I was wanting longer than that because I felt like we, the longer we ran, the better our chances would be. But uh, he was awful tough that day, and we couldn't do nothing with him. We were... We were probably glad to finish second. Whether known as the Gray Fox, the Sly Fox, or the Silver Fox, David Pearson is another driver who preferred spring over summer. He won the third, fourth, and fifth Winston 500s with crafty and dauntless driving, trademarks that served him well during a career in which he claimed 105 Winston Cup checkered flags. They call me uh, the Silver Fox on account of uh, the hair. It's, I guess started out, and some of them would say the uh, Sly Fox because of some of the moves that I'd made, you know, during the, my racing career. So I don't know. Some of it, it all depends on what people thought about, I guess, when they was going to say something. Like most champions, number 21 remembers grueling duels with strong competitors as if they occurred yesterday. Many of his rivals would just as soon forget the confrontations. As far as I know, I never looked at the entry blank or anything like that to find out uh, how much the race pays before you go to it, you know, or anything like that, because you go there, you're going anyway, and you're going to try to win anyway. So no matter where it's paying $100, or $1,000, or whatever, 100000 you still go there for the same purpose, and that's to win. Of course, Pearson was good at just laying around and waiting until the thing got done. And with, and with the Woods Brothers at that time, they, they had a, a good, good fielded car also. And the crew was great. He'd get behind, they'd catch him up. And so it was a good team thing. Cale Yarborough, a nifty move on that last lap. Well, Ned, you know, I just want to thank the good Lord for a good, safe race today. But the car ran real good all day, and I just, uh, you know, tried to play it cool. I knew if I'd keep my cool and wait to the last lap, that I thought I could beat him, so I did. Anyone who is tangled with Cale Yarbrough on the racetrack will tell you he was one of the more skillful Winston Cup drivers who accepted a green flag and turned it into a checkered flag. That happened three times at Talladega Super Speedway and 83 times overall. The 84 race was um, one of the toughest races that, that I've ever run at Talladega. There were so many lead changes and uh, uh, so many cars were running good, and we gambled on, a, on a, uh, the fuel situation there, and uh, we were completely out when it was over, but uh, it, it paid off for us. Is there something Cale Yarborough would like to add about racing on the steep banks in Alabama? You have to drive with your rear view mirror at Talladega uh, to be able to keep the guys behind you if you're leading the race on the last lap, and uh, it's just that simple. You have to, it's like a checker game. You, you pick cars and uh, maneuver off of them and, and watch what they're doing in the back and hope they're racing side by side and uh, we'll let you come on the win. There are more than a few reasons why the rear view mirror is important at Talladega Super Speedway. Two of the more significant are the importance of impressive drafting and the unusual positioning of the start finish line. Many races have been determined by a car using the draft to gain speed and slingshotting around the leader on the front straightaway. That has become the norm because the start-finish line is almost in the first turn. Buddy Baker can explain the draft. When you're on the interstates and you go up behind the truck, you know that vacuum you feel that kind of buffets your car around, you feel it free up and get a little easier to move along. If you could envision a, a, a wake off a boat, you see the water go out on the sides and it makes a big pocket on both sides and then there's turbulating water behind it trying to follow the boat along. Well, that's pretty much what a draft is. 
dead behind is the most, uh, well, it picks the car up so much just to go right straight in behind. It streamlines the car in front also. The air that's turbulating off the back of the car instead of going down on the ground and building a vacuum. When that second car comes in there, it goes over on the second car and it's like pushing the guy along. And I've seen the time with a good drafting partner, I'd pick up three, 400 RPMs by having a good drafting partner. The start finish line is down towards number one and to, to plan your strategy for a slingshot move on the last lap has got to be different from Daytona. Daytona you, you plan a strategy uh, where you can set him up and you know how far you need to be behind him going into turn one and, and how much uh, run you need on him coming off of turn two so you can clear him by the time you get to turn three and then get to the start finish line before he does. Talladega is, is, is different. The start finish line is on down the racetrack so if you if you played the same game at Talladega that you played at Daytona, he'd be back by you by the time you got to the finish line. So you have to, the strategy is uh, a whole lot different there. You have to uh, do your strategy in uh, turns three and four and make your pass coming out of four to be able to uh, beat him to the start finish line. Quite a bit of different strategy between Daytona and Talladega. The, the thing I guess you do if you lead, you coming off the fourth turn, no matter what your situation is, you have to have a little prayer down through there. I hope you get there first. Obviously, not all prayers are answered at Talladega Super Speedway, but the draft certainly worked well for Ron Bouchard in 1981, with Darrell Waltrip and Terry Labonte paying the price. Thus unfolded a typical exciting finish in Talladega. In 1981, I thought we had the race won. I thought I was right where I needed to be. I was running in second place. Ron was in third, and I thought, well, I, I didn't know what to do about him. I couldn't really do much about, you know, what he was going to do. And so I was trying to pass Darrell, and I got a run on Darrell, and I tried to pass him on the inside, and he blocked me down low, so I went back to the outside, and he blocked me up high, and we went through the trial real high on the, on the track, side by side. And so I was hoping Bouchard would go with me, but he didn't. We got side by side, and he just went off to the inside of us and just barely passed both of us at the finish line. And uh, we crossed the line down there, and... Uh, it's like we're slowing down. Darrell looks at me and I look at him and we just kind of go like this, you know. <laughs> Neither one of us wanted. Terry was trying to get by me on the outside and I done pushed him up in the wall and he had bounced off and hit me and I bounced into him and we were coming down through there just bamming into each other and I'm thinking, I'm going to win this race. And lo and behold, we crossed the start finish line and just by the time we crossed it, I looked over to my left, darned old yellow car. Where'd that thing come from? Who was that? Was that a lap car? No, it was Ron Bouchard. He slipped by me and Terry both and won the race, and he was miles behind us. I was running third, and uh, Darrell was leading the race, and Terry Labonte was second. And because of where the stat finish line is at Talladega, uh, it gives you an opportunity to make a, a very late pass, not like at Daytona. So when we came down the front straightaway on the white flag lap, uh, Terry started to make his move, and he started to drive up around the outside of Darrell, and when he did, uh, I think, and Darrell has admitted after, that he basically worried about Terry passing him. And, and he worked on him, and he moved him around on the racetrack, and it really left me a lot of room. And I was able to draft off the two cars, come off the fourth turn in third place, and beat him at the start finish line by about a half a fender. So it was exciting. I didn't know I won the race until I looked over on the scoreboard, and there it was, 47. As the 
is calling Race fans from near and far Talladega, you are calling me Talladega victory Talladega victory Everybody knows auto racing is a sport that can be unkind at times. Thankfully, NASCAR procedures make it amazingly safe, as Dick Brooks learned one year at Talladega Super Speedway. That flop that I took was, uh, was certainly a memorable deal. And, uh, you know, you, you, there's no way to describe what it feels like in a car when you're going down the road and all of a sudden it just takes off, just like if you're in an airplane or something. It just takes off and keeps going over in the, in the silence, man. It was, you know, that thing went, uh, five, six hundred feet before it ever hit the first time. And it's quiet. I mean, it just goes from a loud noise to silence. So the doctor kind of cleaned me up and, and uh, gave me some pills and stuff to take in case I got to hurting some. And, uh, and uh, I'm not really a drinking man, but I had a little in the car there, you know. So so on the way home, I, uh, uh, when I got home, I was feeling pretty good. But anyway, next morning, I was kind of glad just to be around. And, and uh, went out and played a little golf, and uh, you know, he was talking to the birds and whistling, singing, just glad to be around. And it's the best round of golf I ever shot. I guess it was limber enough. <laughs> the list of a dozen drivers who have multiple wins at Talladega Super Speedway is completed by five who scored two each. Donnie Allison, Pete Hamilton, and Richard Petty no longer compete on the Winston Cup circuit. Bill Elliott and Ernie Irvin remain in pursuit of checkered flags. Talladega is uh, probably the most fascinating racetrack we ever run on because uh, it's not like any other speedway in the sense that you have room to race here. Uh, it feels like a great big monstrous interstate that's tilted up in the air. Donnie Allison delighted home state fans by winning the 1971 Winston 500 and the 1977 Talladega 500. Darrell Waltrip relieved him behind the wheel in the latter stages of the summer event. Yeah, I did have a really good car, and in fact, by far the best car. And uh, during the race, it, it was it was pretty hot that day, and and I'd asked them in the pit for something to drink. We didn't carry water jug in our car or anything like that, and and so Hoss, being the nice guy that he was, he handed me a uh, a bottle of soda when I stopped in the bottle and he just had taken it out of the cooler. Well, it was really my stupidity. I, I was so thirsty and, and hot, I just turned it up and, and chug-a-lugged about three or four swallows of it. And I guess it was so cold that, and, and the uh, gas from the, the soda, I never made it a full lap before I started feeling like I was gonna pass out. In fact, Bobby pulled up beside me and one was motioning at me what was wrong with me. And I told him we better hurry up and get somebody to drive that car because I was fixing to pass out. Donnie Allison thrilled fans by finishing just in front of his famous brother, Bobby Allison, in the 1971 Winston 500. I think that, uh, I think we did it six or seven times, first and second. And I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, if you look at the record books, you find one there where he won and I run second. Perhaps no other driver has thrilled Talladega Super Speedway fans like Bill Elliott. In 1985, he won with an average speed of 186.2 miles per hour. He took the checkered flag after falling behind five miles under green flag conditions. At that time, that's the first year they came out with a Winston Million. So to come here and when the oil line came loose on the car, and I remember coming down pit road, and stopping, and I thought that was the end of the day, but the way the circumstances was, everything kind of went back in our direction. A lot of cars fell out. You know, Kale ran awful well that day. He led a lot of the race, you know, and I was able to make it back up, and a lot of people I talked to said that was a race they'll always remember. Nobody on the Winston Cup circuit has run as fast as Bill Elliott at Talladega Super Speedway. He qualified first seven times between 1985 and 1990, he went 212.8 miles per hour in 1987. I think this racetrack was built for even quicker speeds than that. And, you know, the thing of it is, is when I run 212, you know, you still run flat out. I think running 210 at Daytona was as far as a little harder because the corners are a little tighter at Daytona and it's just a little bit shorter than here at Talladega. But Talladega was built for the speed and I think you could probably run even faster than that. At age 28, Pete Hamilton made a giant splash during 1970, 
by winning both events at Alabama International Motor Speedway. His average speed in the Talladega 500 was 158.5 miles per hour, a record established despite the use of restrictor plates. Looking back now at the, at the two races that I won in Talladega in 1970, uh, a lot of the thoughts of the both races probably blend together because it's been 24 years uh, since, I've, uh, since I've raced there. I do remember one thing that uh, uh, either, I think it was probably uh, the summertime race, but I remember coming by and seeing Maurice Petty hold up the easy sign and slow down sign all the time, and that didn't seem to uh, fit too much with racing, but I tried to slow down as much as I could, but uh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't the easiest thing to do for a, uh, for a young race driver. Ernie Irvin entered the 1994 Winston Cup season as one of the hotter drivers. Always a threat at Talladega Super Speedway, he took checkered flags in the 1992 Die Hard 500 and the 1993 Winston 500. Tony come on the radio and said, you know, I think they're going to finish under caution. And I said, well, that really makes me mad because we come here to win the race and we're not, we're not leading now. And we hadn't led a lot during the day, but I'd like to have a shot at it. Richard Petty, the king, delighted fans every place he went before retiring in 1992. He cherished two wins at Talladega Super Speedway that came nine years apart. To me, Talladega was, is not a very hard place to drive. Uh, like Daytona, you got to, you know, sort of thread the needle to make a good lap and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, at Talladega, the car is more important than the driver. Uh, you know, if you, it's not a deal where the car has to handle that good, it just needs to run that fast. Of course, now when you get down to the last lap, then the drivers, you know, they, they get involved in the thing and they, they get very important. But if the car wasn't good enough to get them there, then the driver can't carry the car. Me and Donnie and Betty Baker, and we must have run eight or ten laps side by side. I mean, some of the cars might have been faster, but we got hung up beside each other and there was nobody in front of us. And we was racing for the lead and we run side by side. I don't believe I've never seen anybody run that much, that long that good, you know what I mean, I don't know what, one of us probably finally run it, the other one bluffed one of them out or something, but anyhow, we run, I, I never run side by side that long with anybody, and then there was three of us doing it at that time. A dozen drivers have claimed one victory each at Talladega Super Speedway, making them suitable companions for a dozen drivers who have won more than once on the fastest of racetracks. Obviously, they have memorable moments to share, as they reflect on wild chases to the start-finish line. What you get into is you start playing high-speed chess here, and you got the chess board laid out in front of you, and you're making the moves, and you're thinking what you're going to do to beat this guy right over here, or that guy behind you. And you might make the move to whip one guy, but then somebody that you didn't see back then at line, once you all play your hand, he's, man, he, you set him up, you know, two of you side by side, was up, he goes around. Uh, that's why I think it's so much rewarding to win here. You're not only beating one guy, you got to look in the mirror and try to drive five cars. Well, I think the excitement was so great. Um, you know, I can remember tears coming to my eyes. Uh, I said, after all them years to win a race like this, and uh, it was probably the most exciting thing, other than probably my children, that's ever happened to me. I didn't have any trouble with the track. The tires were, couldn't stand up to the speed we were running. But I had been tire testing for Firestone all year, and we had been in the same situations before. We went, we uh, went to Texas and had the same tire problem, maybe at a little bit lower speed. But uh, I was used to that, and uh, I never had a blowout or anything like that. But uh, just throwing the tread off of them didn't really bother me that much. They were playing with all the rules, trying to change the cars from where they were through the 60s to where they were going in the, in the 70s. And, and these guys had developed a, uh, an intake manifold that, uh, that there was a lot of controversy over anyway. And I never to this day know what was in that thing, but they told me, they said, don't ever let the thing drop under 5,000 RPMs. It's just uh, when you come in the pit, you keep your foot on the gas, and when you get ready to go, you just stand on it and go and, just, and run it just as hard as it'll run, and we'll be all right. So... So we did. We went out and ran that away, and the car did run fast. I think I started like, I can't remember now, but it was way up in the 30s. And on the 10th lap, 10 lap rundown, I was watching the board, on the 10th lap rundown, I was sixth. And uh, I said, whoa, man, we got something here if this thing don't jump the fence, you know. And I was just really sweating it then. They were coming ready. They kept saying, back off more, back off more. You're like 30 seconds ahead. You're like 27 seconds ahead. Back off more. It felt like I was crawling out there, you know, and so uh, 
we got to run around there, and uh, so you know the fuel pressure started moving a little bit. But it does that, you know. Uh, we, we got a reserve pretty good. Of, uh, we always figure we can go about 10 miles, eight miles on that. So, you know, we come by. It's hard to believe though. You know, we got the white flag then, and I said, "Boy, I think I'm going to run out of gas. I think I'm going to run out of gas." And so we come around there, and it was we had uh, we only held like 19 or 20 gallons. You know, so we had a couple gallons there. But it, it was a good feeling to win Talladega, the big track we had run good there years back, and had never got to break to win and. Uh, I really didn't think I was ever going to win at Talladega, and uh, so uh, it uh, just all of a sudden. And the best words you're driving ever hear in your life is that if, if the caution, if it stays green, you got it in the bag, and there's nobody to race. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great feeling. On that last restart, you know, I was leading, and they just blew by me. Um, just you know, just didn't get a very good start, and I mean, I got shuffled all the way back to sixth or eighth, and I think, you know, I was thinking you know my crew they probably think well there goes our chance to win the race but even when that happened I knew I said you know this car's strong I know I'm gonna come back by these guys and you know just one at a time got right back up to the front and uh, once I did you know it was just determined not to let anyone else get by me and uh, it's just a great race great feeling they talk about upset I guess that's where the word upset comes into this picture it was an upset but we earned it and we worked for it Work harder than most most of the big teams, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's hard to race like we race as an independent because we know what to do. Majority of us do, and uh, we know how to make car go fast. We know how to put people together. It's just that we don't have the funding to do it. And it's real. I think it's harder on an independent to race under that kind of pressure than say the guy that's out there leading every lap and. You know, uh, I heard some of the big guys complaining of stress and doing this and then how hard it was. They don't know what hard is till they try it from the back back here. In 89 when we won the race here, I was pro that was probably the happiest I've ever been as far as winning a race. That race meant more to me than, than probably all the rest of them. And because of the fact that I had come close so many times here to winning, and uh, I just never got there. You know, I'd finish second, I'd finish third, I'd finish fourth. I'd be leading on the white flag lap or, or third on the white flag lap or second on the white flag lap. And I probably wanted to win this race more than anyone uh, that I'd run. Talladega is, is special. Uh, uh, I've met a lot of great people down there, uh, uh, a lot of good places to go eat uh, catfish, a lot of good places to go fishing. Uh, a lot of good places to go eat barbecue. Uh, I mean, Talladega is just kind of a special place to me. Uh, uh, one day uh, when Mr. France Sr. was uh, still alive, he came in the garage, and um, in fact, it could have been in 76, but uh, he said, you busy for a couple hours? And I said, no, and he said, come on with me. And I got in the car, and we drove out of the racetrack and went over to Palm Clo Coast uh, Clothing, or Palm Beach, is it? Uh, clothing warehouse over there. and. Um, he said, I want you to pick a couple suits out. And he told the lady in there, he said, uh, put those on my bill. He's going to pick out some shirts and, and a couple suits and sport jackets and stuff, put it on my bill. And uh, that's the kind of man he was. Uh, Victory Lane was, was really exciting and, and gratifying to me uh, because it was the first time that my wife, Marcia, had ever been to Victory Lane with me. And, uh, and we, had, we had had a daughter uh, back in December of 1987, so she was about five or six months old. And, uh, and obviously that was the first time she'd ever been there, but for them to be there to share it, to share it with me meant an awful lot because I think, you know, at that, at that very moment, my wife realized, you know, what it was all about, what, why, I, why I do what I do, because uh, I'm sure that the look on my face, she realized that, uh, that you know, man, this is, this is what, you know, this is what he worked for all his life. The race I won at Talladega, we were running in the, in the one nineties average, and if we got to drafting or, or somebody was a little ahead of you, was catching them, you could average laps of two hundred or plus. And that day that I won the race down there, I, I remember I went in one number one corner one time. It was kind of near the end of the race. I run in wide open up high, and right in the middle of one and two, I ducked down to the bottom and went under a guy. And when I come off a two, I went around the outside of somebody. And I'm, I, I was running 198, 200 miles an hour when I done this. Car felt excellent. I just never had to consider cracking the throttle. I spun out coming into pits that day too. Uh, it was the first year Sears sponsored the race, and we always ran die hard batteries. I spun out coming into pits, and it was the funniest thing. Old Buddy Baker was pitted right behind me, and I came into pits and spun out and stopped in my pit, perfect, just the wrong way. And Buddy's there like 
looking like he doesn't know if he's messed up or I'm messed up, but one of us ain't right. You know, we ain't supposed to be looking at each other during the pit stop. We got a recrank, went back out there, got up towards the front, went to the back, started coming back up towards the front. And I mean, we was pretty happy with a couple laps to go and we're fifth, sixth, and we got a shot again. And you don't know what's gonna happen because your moves are governed by the cars in front of you. And we get a run around the top, coming through tri-oval, and we just go past start finish line. Sterling went down, I followed him, they wiggled, big old hole at the top, and it was just enough of a gap to get going there. But when we were running them down, I was really on a mission because I had messed up so bad to put myself back there about 20th position with 10, 11, 15, whatever laps to go, that uh, I knew I was gonna get shot by my pit crew when I pulled in the pit, so we had to get back up there. From unusual spin-outs to dramatic finishes, Talladega Super Speedway is a place for purebred winners. To take the checkered flag there will always remain special. That must have been what Bill France had in mind in 1969 when he made sure his dream would become a reality. Playing a hand in his mission was Richard Brickhouse, the first winner and the proud owner of a cherished ring. I was totally confident that I was doing the right thing. I, I was, uh, I hated that it was under the uh, controversy that it was, but me being a businessman too, I knew that, uh, that it meant a lot to the track owner which, and, and NASCAR. And I feel like that sometime in history that uh, me having a race that day helped prevent a, a bad day for racing. Had had they not had that race, it would have been much worse. And uh, I, I hope that it'll go down in history that way.
Oh 